TJ Lavin roasting a quitter. You love to see it. Plus, we've got the Godfather holding court, our first true vote of the season, and a great daily challenge to get you caught up on. It's the Challenge All-Stars Episode 4 recap coming up right now. What up and welcome, my fellow challenge lovers. Welcome to The Challenge Historian, where we dive deep into all things MTV's The Challenge, past, present, or future. If it's happening in the challenge universe, then we are here to document it. I am your host and dedicated challenge historian, Jacob Hollibaugh. Thank you so very, very much for being here with us today. On today's podcast, we've got a good one. We're talking all things Challenge All-Stars Episode 4. We will first break down the whole episode section by section, then give out some awards, our quote of the week, weekly MVP, talk about some power rankings before finally learning a little challenge history at the end of the pod. It's a lot to cover, so blow that horn, TJ. We are getting started. Diving right on into our episode breakdown section by section. Yet again, we've got a four section episode here. It's followed the same formula, basic challenge formula. The first three episodes of all stars have, we've got everything back at the house pre daily challenge. We've got the daily challenge as the second section, the deliberation in house time as the third section, and then finishing up with the elimination round. So we'll go through each one, one by one, starting with Everything back at the house, post-elimination, pre-next daily challenge. Nehemiah victorious, coming on back to the house. And only this section a little bit shorter than normal. They get to the daily challenge pretty quick, but a few things to point out slash discuss before we move to that daily challenge. First and foremost, we find out Beth and Cyrus have grown to be pretty close friends outside of the show. And finding this out leads us to kind of diving into Beth's family and background a little bit more. And She's the first person of the season doing what could have been expected coming in, missing her family. Uh, it's a big, you know, a bit of a shift with the cast of this all-star season, being older, being a little bit, most of them on average, a little further into that kind of family and home life and careers and whatnot than some of the folks on the regular season of the challenge are. So this was expected coming in. Who would be the first one out of the many of them with spouses, with children that was going to start missing that in a big way, Beth, at least by, you know, the edit, who knows? I'm sure all of them obviously are, but Beth is the first one to really start showing it. Cyrus is there, though, to pick her up, get a little pet back in her step, talk her back into why she is there and why it would be so amazing to go home to that husband and children with $500,000. But a good reminder right off the top that these people are a bit older, a little further along in life than they used to be when they were on here. Now they've got a lot more that they're playing for and that they're thinking about when being stuck in a house with a bunch of other crazy people. Then... Speaking of being stuck in a house with a bunch of crazy people, let's move right on to Arissa. We get right into Arissa's backstory a tiny bit, what she's been up to ever since we saw her in the MTV world. We find out she's now a cannabis chef, as she says, mixing food and weed, her two passions together. Um, We find all this out as she's doing a little outdoor smudging session, some sun salutations, overall energy rituals, and mostly just keeping to herself. Um, she is so far, we haven't seen almost any of Arissa other than seeing that she's kind of been keeping to herself. And this episode starts us right off with here's Arissa's story. Here's what's going on with her. And right away, you know, this is going to be an Arissa centric episode that they are setting her up to be a main portion of the plot line in the episode. Final thing about the pre daily challenge at the house segment is we do find out I had been a little bit curious if You know, they got the bubble bar. We found out about that or their version of the bubble bar, the COVID friendly bar on site. Um, We know all the different, you know, the outdoor stuff set up that they got with the foosball table and the pool and the ping pong table and the hot tub and all this, that, the other. But I was always curious whether the old OGs get themselves a full on gym the way most of the regular challenge seasons these days now get a full on functioning gym to be working out in all the time. And the answer is... Kind of a little bit. It's not quite the full 
built out thing that we've come used to seeing on the regular show, but they've got a set of kettlebells. They've got some free weights. They've got plenty of space to actually do a little bit of running around outside. They've got yoga mats and stuff. Kendall's out there yet again. We see the consistent, most consistent thing across every one of these episodes is that we get a glimpse of Kendall doing yoga by the river, which by all means, if you're in that beautiful place and you're into yoga, you should be doing it as much as you can out there. It's got to be a very peaceful place to be doing that. But They've got somewhat of, they got like a half setup, which uh, seems about right for this crew of people. And during the moments where we're getting to see this workout setup is because we're getting to witness a little conversation between Derek and Katie, where Der- or where Katie, excuse me, spills the, the secrets to Derek that, shh, don't tell anyone, but even though no one's seen me do it, I've actually been working out a couple times, and I'm coming in here a little bit more physically prepared than I ever have before, which, you know, let's uh, let's see it. Um, I mean, she looks great. Um, still just on the smaller, shorter side, smaller side in general, so anything that if the weight's going to be involved or size, strength's going to be involved, I'm not necessarily picking Katie to be at the top of the pack, but Good to know that she did come into this, taking it as serious as she ever has. Um, And good to know that all of the challengers on this season are uh, being given the tools to work on that physical side of the game while they're there. So that's everything we've got pre-daily challenge. Let's go ahead and move right on into then the daily challenge of the episode. Daily challenge time. We get on the ropes, which is a variation on... Uh, many classic challenge challenges, classic challenge daily challenges, excuse me there. Um, uh, there's not one specific version of the hanging on ropes over water challenge that has kind of risen above the rest. There's always something related to this on almost every season. So it is a spin on a classic challenge genre here with the ropes over water, either racing across or fighting your way across or a mixture of both, as is the case here. Um, one question with the actual challenge itself, uh, that I do have, I have this all the time on the challenge. I have a lot of questions for producers. If I ever get to meet someone who's a, like one of the lead producers on this show, working on the actual challenges and eliminations, man, and I'm going to buy them 12 straight beers because well, I need to be talking to them all night long. I have so many questions, but one of them that comes up here yet again, um, is I want to know how random random is when they say we've drawn teams randomly do they actually try to pick somewhat fair teams or is it a straight up random draw by the way these teams look uh as usual i i lean towards it's either a actual random draw or if they are picking quote unquote fair teams that they're actually just picking teams where the people they want to win win which i'm Slightly led to believe maybe with this one, I think they knew they wanted to maybe get Mark or Derek uh, the best chance they had to win to get that lifesaver. I think they want someone to use that lifesaver, as we'll get to later on. It does eventually get used. Spoiler alert, but you know if you're listening to this, you've already seen the episode, obviously, so we'll cover all that in a bit. But I just want to know how random random is. These teams weren't exactly the most fair once broken out, but... That's how it goes on the challenge. You work with what you're dealt. Now, as for the performances given during this daily challenge, again, really like the challenge. Uh, Pretty good spin on the ropes over water with it being a race with a small, uh, I guess not fighting element, but a knocking each other off element um, via winning your legs of the race and whatnot and added both a strength and a strategic component to it to some small degree. I mean, the strategy in the end, I was going to take notes on what strategy would have been best, but it was pretty clear. They all figured out you just, you know, whatever one they're standing on, you unhook that one. Um, and there's really no, no argument for anything else. So not a lot of strategy involved, but at least a tiny bit from the person on the rope having to figure out, you know, a few people were, did manage to stay on when a rope was released while they were on it. So, um, some strategy involved, but mostly physical here, race across the ropes. Performances that stood out. Kendall and Kellyanne. First off, we'll start with Kendall. First heat, Kendall starts the whole thing off versus Alton, who, as you know now, by now, if uh, five episodes in here, um, if you haven't figured it out, uh, I'm obsessed with Alton. I think he is amazing. And the fact 
that you put him up on a rope and you ask Kendall to go one-on-one with him to start off in a, uh, in a contest where the moment you get behind the team you're in a heat against, you pretty much lose. You know, you lose that first rope, that first person, and it's very difficult, as we saw here, to catch up. And Kendall almost keeps up all the way down and back with Alton. And then even though he slightly beats her, she is one of the few people able to stay on the rope once one is released. That leads her to being able to release one, getting them the upper hand early on. She then closes out her team's heat by getting down and back again in a very, very fast fashion. So another very impressive physical performance by Kendall, matched by her teammate at the time, Kelly Ann, also crushes it. And... When Kellyanne goes, she's crushing it the whole time. She goes so, so fast. And meanwhile, an absolutely horrible edit for Jeanne, where it started out as what looked like a very good edit, where they're really talking her up, uh, back up a tiny bit. Jeanne's on the rope. Uh, they take one out. And she doesn't fall. She stays on. But now she doesn't have all the ropes to work with. She's slowly shimmying her way across. And by the time that she gets uh, she gets about one and a half ways done, she's already gone all the way down, started her way back. They dropped the other rope. She's now sitting instead of standing. But she's still got enough time to crawl on back. Meanwhile, Kellyanne's just starting her initial down and back. They do this whole big edit. They talk about, you know, how John A is a lot stronger this time around. She's a mother now. She's so she's extremely motivated and she's just an all around better challenger. They're playing this awesome song behind her. She's pulling herself back up on the rope. She's moving across and you're like, oh, this is amazing. This is such a great moment for John A. They really, you know, set this up to be a, like awesome moment for her. She'll turn it around for a team. And then Kellyanne catches her and drops her in the water. <laughs> just like that, all of this build up, they've kind of ignored that Kellyanne's even on the other rope and going to build up Jeanne only to have her get dropped in the water a couple feet from the platform. So I thought that was a, just a brutal edit um, for her. Not super cool, but you got to play up the entertainment. Somehow Kellyanne absolutely crushed it. Her and Kendall both on the female side of things really continue to separate themselves as the two competitors to beat, at least when it comes to the daily challenges, um, being able to bring kind of the strength, the speed, the agility, the intelligence, the whole thing to those daily challenges. They've a little bit separated themselves from the pack. I'm on the guy side. Uh, one thing to point out, we mentioned Alton before, um, he does get down and back very quickly his first time down, but then he is ended up being the last person on his team on the stand with one rope. And I've got to say, this is how much I believe in this guy. It didn't come to fruition, but the moment it gets to just him and they show him jump up on the rope, no fear and start shimmying down with legs and hands on one rope. And Kendall is up again on the other side. There was definitely a part of me that was just like, oh, Alton's just going to shimmy back and forth four straight times and win this whole thing over and over and over on one rope. He's just going to do it because that's Alton. That's what he's going to do. And Kendall did beat him again. Impressive performance from her. But uh, just to give some light to my true faith in this man when it comes to anything somewhat climbing related or anything athletic, I thought for a moment the second he got on there, I was like, "Mm, I don't know if that other team might still be in trouble here. But alas, they were not. Um, the only other male performances to point out is when it came down to the second heat, the entire heat came down to just the very first person, Derek versus Nehemiah, whoever got across first and was able to drop the other one. The whole heat was going to be over at that point. And Derek edges out Nehemiah. Both of them seem to move as fast across the ropes as anyone else. So Nehemiah, while Ends up falling in the water here. Still another good uh, physical performance from him. Derek showing his stuff. This challenge was a great challenge, really tailored to a lot of his strengths. So awesome performance by Derek. And the moment he drops Nehemiah in the water with a pretty stacked team with Mark and Ruthie and Anissa and Yes behind him. I mean, that thing, it was over immediately. Um, Which means me that I... My last point, um, so Mark, Derek, Ruthie, Yes, and Anissa get the win. And the only thing negative uh, that I have to say about this daily challenge is something that kind of grinds my gears a bit anytime that this happens on daily challenges. But I never really love the ones where there's multiple heats 
Um, and it's just whoever was the fastest at winning their particular heat or lost the worst in their particular heat or lost the quickest in their heat that ends up losing or winning. I love ones that everyone goes against everyone or somehow there's some sort of bracket built in where, you know, the losers face off to see who the actual loser that goes straight into elimination is, or the two winners of the heat face off, something like that. I don't always love when it's um, a little bit dependent on matchups in this one, you know, the matchups are relatively fair all, all the way around. Again, the team that won Mark, Derek, Ruthie, yes. Anissa, I think was pretty stacked um, to begin with, but um, always just leaves a slight sour taste in my mouth that we can't get uh, what feels like a true, true winner and a true, true loser in the event that that loser is, you know, going straight to elimination and that winner is getting some specific power. I don't, I'd like to have seen them maybe do a second heat with the two losers and the two winners squaring off, but that's just me. That's the daily challenge overall, really good challenge and getting a little bit back more to some of those classic challenges that we kind of expected coming in to an OG all-star season uh, variation on a game that is played, you know, almost every challenge after challenge in a new little form, a little, little twist to it, but loved it. Good performances by a lot of folks. Now we will move on to section three of the show, the deliberation and cocktail hour. On to the deliberation time. Uh, we get some further peeks at where the alliances have started to land within this season. It's taken a few episodes in for real alliances to start showing themselves. And as we'll talk about later, we get our first actual vote where people actually have to put a real vote out there later on. But we'll go through deliberation section first. Um, it immediately starts with Beth, who has gotten uh, was the female captain of the team that got last. She is now straight into elimination. Every female is up for nomination other than Ruthie, who is the captain of the winning team. And we get Jemmy, Beth, Nehemiah, and Cyrus, which seems like the closest little four-person alliance within the house with Jemmy and Nehemiah being close working together, Beth and Cyrus being close working together, and Jemmy and Beth having that newfound close relationship. The four of them are a little bit of kind of the only real like four deep powerful alliance that we know of really at this point, they get together, they talk through their options. They immediately thankfully are smart enough to realize that, Hey, Mark got the lifesaver. Mark's going to use the lifesaver. Mark's going to use this power. So it's not all up to Beth as it has been up to all of those going straight to the elimination before her, but they'd, decide that, you know, Katie's the best option. Arissa's the second best option. Those are the people Beth feels the most confident verse, but none of that is going to matter in the moment because, uh, Mark long is taking full control of this episode of this deliberation of this cocktail hour of everything before he can do that. They have the actual deliberation and where Katie steps up uh, nominates herself, says, you know, I wasn't willing to do the challenge today. I just jumped off. So um, I'll go ahead and go into the elimination, which uh, is very kind of her, but as is quickly pointed out by Darrell, that she might be throwing herself in, but Mark could just, you know, save her. And <laughs> I've got to say, uh, sorry, Katie, I've got to put it out there. Her acting in this moment, acting like she both doesn't had it thought about that or doesn't explicitly know that Mark is going to save her horrible, horrible poker face, horrible lying. And or I guess not explicit lying. She doesn't say anything back. She lets everyone else kind of respond. She makes a face. She does a little funny chin uh, scratch, but you could tell she knows exactly what's about to happen. She does not seem while she acts in her interviews, like, you know, I'm putting myself in, you know, I'm doing, doing the right thing here, which, you know, she might be, it's pretty clear. She knows Mark's going to save her. It's pretty clear to the whole house that Mark's going to use that life saver shield. And if it wasn't clear when we get to the cocktail hour, it is made very, very clear. First off, they're back in, um, I need to not call it the bubble bar. That's just what it's what we called the last two places um, during this COVID era of the challenge where they can't go to actual bars out in public. There's though being an open outdoor space isn't quite the bubble bar. So the barn bar, I don't know, we'll come up with something better for future episodes, but good to see one. This cocktail hour actually features real drinking, not, you know, 
no, nothing against anyone that doesn't want to drink or whatever, but in the past on these shows, there was much more of a party atmosphere, much more of a fun, laid back vibe. People were getting a little loose, getting a little wild. And we're definitely happy to see that back here at the Challenge Historian with these OGs, bringing that vibe back, keeping things a little more laid back here and there. But strategy and game talk does seep into the cocktail hour in a big way because Mark Long and with the help of his trusty assistant, Derek, assistant Jester, uh, I, I don't know what you want to call Derek's um, relationship to Mark Long throughout this little segment, but um, he is there to serve the Godfather, and he's hilarious the whole time doing it, holding up this trophy the whole time. His arms had to be tired by the end of the night. Every time you see him, he's holding that trophy thing way up in the air, regardless of how much it, it weighs. He's just holding his air in the air the whole time. He's always down on one knee, presenting everyone, each and every female contestant is brought to Mark to talk about the life shield and if they want to go in, who they would vote for, this, that, and the other. Derek is there to bring each and every person over into Mark Long's graces. So what I got to say about this, first off, um, from the production side, is just you give the people who are good at the television show aspect of the challenge the power in the game and you're going to get a good television show. Giving Mark Long, I mean, they didn't give him it, but again, I have my suspicions about how the teams were picked. But regardless, when, when I should say, maybe not give, but when someone who is good at the television show portion of the challenge wins and gets power within the game of the challenge, it makes for the best version of the TV show. And this is example A, Y. Um, let's first start this off with a uh, quote. Our first nominee for a quote of the week that we will crown later comes from the Godfather himself as to that responsibility he now holds as the holder of the life shield. Take it away, Mark. Over, Miss Jemmy. Have a seat, Miss Kendall. With power comes great responsibility. It also comes with great swag. So we're going to have a fun night tonight. I'm going to talk to every girl. I'm going to see why they think I should or should not use that lifesaver. The Godfather is talking. Not quite the Spider-Man quote that we're all super familiar with, but close enough, close enough. So Mark holds court quite literally one by one. Every female contestant, not named Arissa, who is keeping to herself, staying away from the party at all costs, comes over to Mark and to Derek. Most of the time Derek's there and he makes a deal with every single one of them. Every single one, classic deal making in the challenge, just one by one, look, you know, I'm thinking about using this, do you think I should use this? Okay, I'm gonna use it, but don't worry, I would never say your name, but you're never gonna say my name, right? Just incredible stuff from Mark, and thankfully for, on Derek's behalf, he does throw Derek in, I think one of the times I hear him say us and kind of motion towards Derek, so Derek's getting something out of the deal here by just sitting there holding up the crown the whole time. Um, speaking of uh, the crown, I just said crown instead of trophy, but speaking of that crown, Mark, the godfather long, wears an absurd crown the entire time he's doing this, an uh, absolutely ridiculous light up necklace, string of lights wrapped around his neck as a necklace. It's all absurd. It's all ridiculous. And it's all absolutely perfect. It's fantastic TV. Again, give the people who are good at the show part the power in the game, and you're going to get a good television show. We've seen this a bunch recently, most uh, recent of all in Double Agents. Big T wins two challenges. Guess what? Those were the two best cocktail hour sections of any episode on Double Agents because she had the power. She knew what to do with it. She made a big, glamorous, fun event of it. Had a lot of laughs, had a lot of fun. Give people who are good at the show power within the game. You're going to get a great television show out of it. And that happens here in a big, big way with Mark Long holding court, showing why he is the godfather of this show. Final thing of the deliberation, we get to kind of circle back around to early in the episode when we mentioned Beth, you know, talks about missing her fo or her folks, her husband and children back home. We're reminded again that all these people do now, a lot of them have families, have children, and how cool it is that they're taking time out of doing all that away from all those things to be on television for our entertainment, doing this game, as much fun as it must be to be there. They are you know, doing a job providing entertainment for us. So we thank them for that. We get a uh, Beth call home to her family 
It's super cute, super sweet. Awesome to see her interact with the family. Her her uh, boy sounds like a genius in the making. 97 on his test. Well done. I think his name was Nicholas. Great job, Nicholas. Shout out to you. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, all the questions I have from producers, this is another one. Uh, how? What are the communication rules, especially on a season like this? How often are these people allowed to call home? How often are some of these people that, you know, yes, uh, runs his own architecture firm, uh, Katie, it runs her own interior design company. Um, there's at least another one or two people um, uh, that, you know, run or CEOs or founders of their own companies and whatnot or running their own things. Are they allowed to make business calls every other day, every day, never look at emails ever? How often can they call their home to their families or friends? Can they call more often if they have kids or don't have kids? Every season, I want to know these rules. Sometimes we get a little bit more clarity. In the early seasons, we kind of got a lot of clarity where they'd be like, there's a room with the phone, and uh, you know, once a week, we all get 10 minutes. Or like I remember on the island, specifically, infamously, Abram uh, had to leave the show because they all, in the middle of the season, got one single phone call on a cell phone. They got 10 minutes on a phone one single time. He calls, finds out his construction company's blowing up to shit without him there and decides he's got to give himself up to remove himself from the game to go take care of this all these fires that have started, which inevitably... Uh, saves Johnny Bananas from going home, leads to Johnny Bananas' first win. He's now potentially the GOAT of the challenge, a big turning point back because of those phone calls. But we knew the rules back then. Um, and, you know, some seasons it's not very clear. This season it's not clear. This is the first one we've seen. I would assume that it was part of the deal of all these people coming that maybe they got more communication with the outside world than the average challenge season. Who knows? But that's stuff I would love to know. So, any producers of the challenge out there listening, you can come on this podcast anytime you are ready and answer all of my questions. I do have a lot of them. That's the end of that section, though. We will transition to the final section of the episode. That is the elimination round. We get to the elimination round, and we get the moment we've been waiting most of the season for the first twist, if you will, though, you know, announced twist that we just haven't got to see the results of yet. The lifesaver, it's going to be in use. We're pretty confident of that going in. They try to build it up like Mark maybe won't use it, but seems like he's going to use it at some point here. And so it's Beth versus Katie. So we think TJ goes ahead and asks Mark, you want to use it? He decides, yes, let's do it. And to everyone's a little bit surprise, TJ immediately goes with, all right, it's an immediate vote right now. Darrell, you're up. And Darrell, with a nominee for the quote of the week, responds in kind. Darrell? All right, so Darrell, we'll start with you. Oh, you motherfucker. <laughs> Just, you, you can actually tell when people are really surprised. So clearly Darrell legit one did think that, you know, Mark was just going to get to pick or wouldn't, it would be something more simple than everyone voting and definitely didn't think they would have to immediately vote by the end of the sentence TJ finished and that Darrell would just immediately be called on hilarious moment from him. So they're all forced to vote and, you know, Darrell to kick it off has no idea who to vote for, uh, for a guy who loves flying under the radar, who loves just, you know, having an alliance, but not really being against anyone else's alliance, tough spot for him to be in goes way against his entire gameplay and strategy to have to be the first one to not just the first one voting here, but again, this is the first real vote of the whole season. Every deliberation so far has been either someone nominating themselves or someone that's the obvious pick that the person wants to go against and that everyone just kind of agrees before they even deliberate. So no real votes have even been had. So this is the first vote of the entire season. First time to really put those alliances out on blast for the entire crew to see Darrell up first. He asks Beth who she wants. She says, why not Arissa? He goes with Arissa. And that starts what first looks like is going to be an overwhelming vote for Arissa. However, a few people in, we get a vote for Kendall, and then we get a second vote. For, well, then, here, let me back up. We get a vote, our first vote from Ken, for Kendall, which comes from Anissa. And Kendall makes the first just absurd voting mistake of the evening. It does not come back to haunt her, but she immediately, the moment Anissa says her name, 
gets a little mad and says, well, then I'm going to vote for you, Anissa, which Anissa very smartly realizes, well, that was dumb. I don't care. Sure, whatever. Because Kendall, at, two people have voted for Arissa. Beth has asked for Arissa. You know that Arissa is about to get a lot of votes. You are now being proposed as the only other main option against Arissa. So don't get a spite vote, a petty vote. Just say, oh, Anissa, you just said my name. I'm going to say it right back. You vote for Arissa if you don't want to go into the elimination. Now, it doesn't cost her, but it was a bad vote. It's a bad strategy. It's a bad vote. You got to play a little bit smarter, a little bit of that inexperience, only one season under a belt, albeit the one and done champion, Inferno champ, one time in, one title. We talked about that a few episodes ago in the history lesson, but some of that inexperience on the voting front showing through there. So the vote continues. We get tied up at one point, three to three, uh, Kendall and Arissa, and things are looking like, you know, they could they could go either way. And that's when we get our second extremely dumb vote of the night. And what became a string of bad moments for Arissa, she's up, and I think it's four to three when she's up. And she doesn't vote for Kendall. She says Kellyanne, who has zero votes at the time, doesn't go on to get any other votes. Everyone likes Kellyanne. Most of the people like Kellyanne. They're not voting her in at that time. And it's just mind-blowingly dumb. Another person who's only been on one season before, and that season there wasn't elimination, so there wasn't a voting process of this nature. So a little bit of an experience shining through. But it's you versus someone else. It's four to three. You're up, and you don't vote for the other person. It's just... Horrible, horrible strategy here. It goes on, spirals out of control. Arissa's the vote. She's in. And then we get the actual elimination itself, which is an elimination that we don't get itself. Arissa walks down. She's super mad. She's clearly bummed out as everyone tries to, you know, pump her up a little. As she's leaving the day as she gives a don't touch me, flings some hands off of her, gets down to the floor and just... The first thing she says as she walks down is, can we box? TJ, can, can I box her? No, no, you can't. Are you sure? Can we box? Are you sure we can't box? No, no, we're not going to do that, Arissa. Just <laughs> one, I mean, I don't know if she takes boxing lessons or what. If she just is so angry, she just wants to, the only thing she wants to do is punch a person, and that person being Beth. But honestly, if, if Arissa and Beth boxed, I mean, Beth's been on the bad end of a big punch from Tina once upon a time. But um, I don't know. I'm probably taking Beth in a fight. If, if it's a boxing match between either of those, I don't want to box Beth. She might be the last female in the house that I want to box against. So that was funny. And also just, you know, TJ being in such a spot that he never thought he would have to answer that like three times in a row. No, no, we can't. We're, we're not, we're not going to box. We're not, there's you clearly see there's a game set up. We're not, we're not boxing. We got this big game. We pay a lot of money for it. We set it up. We're, we're going to do that's what we're going to do, Arissa. Not not boxing. Okay, good. We're clear. <laughs> Just great stuff. And then they explain the game. Uh, the game actually, while not being anywhere, you know, not a challenge classic, totally new one to my mind. There's, you know, breaking through walls is something that happens often. Throwing the big medicine balls over things. Uh, those are incorporated a lot. So incorporating some uh, items in some actions that are um, from challenge history. But a brand new game. One I was actually excited for. One... I will say Beth was going to dominate this for sure. This was definitely a good game and a good setup for her. But we don't get to see it because Arissa just goes out, complete guns blazing, decides to quit. And she does so in pretty spectacular fashion. I'll just let her say it all. It's not worth trying to repeat her quotes. We'll let the lady say it herself. Here is Arissa and her explanation for bowing out. Marissa, you don't need a helmet? No, TJ, I don't need a helmet. I'd actually like to address my house right now. So the way y'all pulled this shit was some flagrant snake-ass shit. And while I respect the way that this game is played, what I don't respect is how y'all are living, which is pretty motherfucking foul. And if I can't box her, I don't want any part of it because the reality is when I did win, there's no fucking way I could come back and be under the same roof as y'all motherfuckers. So fuck you, I'm done, y'all can kiss my motherfucking ass, and that's the motherfucking game. Fuck y'all motherfuckers. Is this quitting? Arissa, 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 come on. 
There's the fight. <laughs> All right, don't take care. Uh, Hope to see you never. Now, it doesn't matter how epic your rant and raving is. When you quit, you quit. And if your reason's just you don't want to do it, you're going to hear it from TJ, as we just heard from TJ. Another amazing quote, an amazing moment from TJ. We knew about this coming in. We had seen it in the trailer. So we knew this moment was coming. We didn't know what inspired it or who was the one that was quitting. We finally got it. It lived up to it. It was, I mean, an incredible moment from Arissa. Even is. is as much fun as we can have with someone quitting, uh, as impressive of a quitting as it's ever going to be. But quitting's quitting. She goes out. We'll talk more about challenge quitters in our history lesson later on. But for now, Beth is in the game. Arissa is out of the game. We've lost two females. We've lost two males. We're four episodes in. The Lifesaver has been in play. And we are moving on from this section. That's all for the elimination. That's all for the full episode breakdown. We will transition into our awards for this episode. Awards time for episode four of All Stars here. First off, best quote of the episode. We've got six nominees, a few of which you've already heard you've covered here previously. But we'll go through each and every one before picking a winner. In chronological order, how they happened in the episode. The first one came from Mark Long, the Godfather himself. His quote about the responsibilities within the game. Take it away again, Mark. Over, Miss Jemmy. Have a seat, Miss Kendall. With power comes great responsibility. It also comes with great swag. So we're gonna have a fun night tonight. I'm gonna talk to every girl. I'm gonna see why they think I should or should not use that lifesaver. The Godfather is talking. We're in front of the Godfather, bitch. Yeah. Have some respect. Then we had Arissa letting people know what not to fuck with. Take it away, Arissa. No matter what. Thank you. I want to participate in this game. I don't like people fucking with my money. Just because I'm Zen doesn't mean that I can't revert back to that part of me if need be. Our third nominee came from Darrell, who's always good for a great interview clip for sure. But this time... On his feet, the uh, the line we heard earlier, but when he gets called out by TJ as we're voting right now, and guess what, Darrell, you're up first. Oh, you motherfucker. Let's hear it again from the man himself, Darrell. All right, so Darrell, we'll start with you. Oh, you motherfucker. <laughs> oh. Then... We just played it for you recently. We'll play it one more time because it was pretty epic, and it includes two different nominees for the quote of the week. We got Arissa quitting and TJ's response to her lengthy quitting speech, both of which are up for quote of the week. I know we just heard it, but it's so great. Let's listen to it again. Take it away, Arissa and TJ. Arissa, you don't need a helmet? No, TJ, I don't need a helmet. I'd actually like to address my house right now. So the way y'all pulled this shit was some flagrant snake-ass shit. And while I respect the way that this game is played, what I don't respect is how y'all are living, which is pretty motherfucking foul. And if I can't box her, I don't want any part of it because the reality is when I did win, there's no fucking way I could come back and be under the same roof as y'all motherfuckers. So fuck you, I'm done, y'all can kiss my motherfucking ass, and that's the motherfucking game. Fuck y'all motherfuckers. You're just quitting? Okay, Arissa. Please, no. Arissa. Arissa, come on. Arissa, fight. <laughs> All right, don't take care. Uh, Hope to see you never. And finally, our sixth nominee for quote of the week, Darrell already is in with a nomination for his response to TJ calling him out to vote, but he's here again with another great interview moment from Darrell to end the episode, to cap the entire episode, explaining how dirty of a game this really is and that some people need to figure that out. Take it away, Darrell Taylor. Get out of here. Team back, baby. You know what? This game is meant to be dirty. This ain't the goddamn Brady Bunch. This is the challenge. People are going to get mad. People are going to cry. People are going to backstab. It's the name of the game. Great nominees. Some hilarious. Some honest about the game. 
all of them good, all of them enjoyable, all of them great television, but I am giving the winner of the best quote of this week to Darrell for the, oh, you motherfucker response to TJ being called out the vote. I just thought that was so great in the moment. Uh, encapsulates Darrell. He's just the best. I love Darrell. He's one of the people on this show that you could tell is a great guy in real life outside of the game as much as he you know is in the game. Would just be a blast to hang around and just being called out like this, putting him in that specific spot. A great move by the production staff and by TJ, whoever's deciding either where those people stand, if anyone's deciding that, or who has to vote first. I don't know. Maybe TJ has so much power that he gets to just decide that himself. But either way, someone knew that when we do this, we got to put Darrell on the spot first. It goes against everything he does strategic-wise in this game. Perfect. Oh, you motherfucker. Back to TJ is the quote of the week. Now we'll move into our MVP of the episode, and with respect to Anissa, who receives votes yet again, every episode it seems like she gets votes, both for a solid performance in the Daily Challenge, tried her best, but mostly for, yet again, being the great interview, being the great narrator, and also just around the house, she seems to be one of the ones that, while she definitely has her groups, we've seen her getting a little, a couple fights, alliance-based fights in the last few episodes, but she's kind of one of the ones rallying the social aspect of the house. We love seeing that. She gets some votes. Katie gets some votes for being willing to nominate herself, um, knowing that she you know, didn't step up at the challenge, and for that little fun moment where she's like, hey, Derek, just so you know, I've been working out. Don't tell anyone. That was great. Katie gets some votes. Kendall also gets votes for that impressive performance in the Daily Challenge we talked about. And Derek as well for both the impressive performance, getting the win in the Daily Challenge and leading his team, leading off to beat Nehemiah in that first part of the heat to get that win, as well as being great in the interviews and being the number two man during the cocktail hour to the person who is the MVP of the episode. It was going to happen sooner or later, and it's finally here. Mark Long, the challenge godfather, is the MVP of episode four. This is the one where he comes all the way, full focus, right in the center, and takes his spot as the star of the show. It seems like so far they had been kind of purposely trying to keep him a little more in the background, a little more on the sidelines, knowing he was the one that you know had this idea, put this whole thing together, that it's smart of them to try to keep him a little more in back, that this wasn't just going to be the Mark Long show for nine episodes. Um, but he takes center stage here. He grabs power in the Daily Challenge, gets that win. So that's points for him there. Then he uses that power both in the game to build some more alliances, but also as great fodder for the television show. He does everything he can to make this an entertaining, fun time for the people there in the moment, as well as us at home watching on camera. So he just crushed it from the show side, from the sports side, puts that power to use, uses the lifesaver shield. We've been waiting for someone to do it. We said last week we thought if a Mark or a Derek Durrell, a Nisa, one of the true OGs that's done tons and tons of seasons and has that respect within the house, got a, their whole hands on the lifesaver. We thought they would be the ones that'd be most inclined to just immediately use it just to see what it does. Glad he did. Mark Long, Godfather, MVP of the episode. Then final uh, awards is just the power rankings and a few predictions moving forward. The power rankings basically don't change from last week. We'll go with uh, the female side first since it was a female elimination week. A small change. I'm moving Kendall all the way up to number one. If I had to bet on one female to win a final right now, and again, we know we're doing this uh, male-female, although we are told at the beginning that there's only going to be one winner in the end. Um, I'm still breaking it up and thinking about it through who's going to get to the final and then who could win a final in down the line. Maybe starting next episode, we hit episode five and nine. Maybe we'll move to just an overall power rankings. Who's going to win male or female doesn't matter. But for now, keeping it split up at least one last time. Kendall is my top ranked female right now. Kellyanne coming in second. As we said earlier, those two Kendall and Kellyanne have kind of separated themselves on the physical side of the competition. And Anissa remains in the third spot. Again, I'll say it every week until something changes. She's a shoe in for the finals. Um, she's got great alliances. Everyone loves her. And I don't think anyone's beating her in any of the eliminations we have seen thus far. I don't know that she would lose any of them, even to 
maybe to Callie or Kendall in some of the ones where there's a little more endurance, but most of the eliminations so far, even the one we didn't get to see in action today, have been as much strength-based, strategy-based, experience-based as anything, and Anise is going to win all of those. So I think she's a shoo-in for the final. That's the women's power rankings. Men's side does not change from last week. Mark, Darrell, Alton, my top three, and it's going to take a lot to bump any of them out. I just think, again, Mark... We'll just repeat myself. I'm a broken record week after week with this, but this one, this week, even more than the rest, really nailed it home. Uh, you know, everyone's looking up at him. He's running this game from the background, both literally by putting the game together, but, you know, inside the game as well. I don't think anyone wants to cross him at all. Darrell, the most comfortable person there. He's great on the physical side as much as, you know, he got put on the spot tonight, but he got through it without, you know, unscathed, no one getting upset, the person he voted for going home. So he's still my number two and Alton still just on the physical abilities is my number three. Uh, Predictions moving forward. Uh, We talked about it a week ago, but we'll bring it up again. Now we've had four episodes. We are supposed to only be getting nine episodes. So that tells me that At some point, we're going to have to remove more than one person and episode. It looks like there's going to be a double elimination or purge of some kind next week on the episode, and I would be pretty shocked if there was not. If two people don't leave the show next week, I would be really, really shocked. Um, Maybe we could go one more week, and then, you know, if there's a big purge where it's like, you know, two guys and two girls go home, you know, in episode seven or something or eight or in both episodes, who knows? Um, or maybe, you know, we saw our first glimpse of someone missing their family, missing their kids. Maybe someone does quit and leave. You know, we had our first person quit today, um, albeit one that was in the elimination up for possibly being removed anyway. So we'll see. But my main prediction is we are going to move to a double elimination purge scenario sooner rather than later, probably next week. Now that we've hit an episode five out of supposedly nine. Another prediction, I think there's going to be more nine episodes. I feel like there's got to be, they almost always do it even number. It feels like there's going to be 10, but maybe, you know, with the re- a reunion episode of some sort, there'll be a 10th. Who knows? Um, other prediction is that I feel like at some point the guys, someone's going to have to test the, you know, the big alliances so the or the kind of the big names in the house on both sides, male and female. You have some names that are a little more those legends than they are the OGs, uh, as we've talked about at length on different pods over the season. Um, but Mark Durrell, Derek on the men's side, I feel like next week we know we at least get a, a, a male elimination, if not some sort of double purge, whatever. We, a guy's going home. I don't know that it'll be one of those three big names, Mark Durrell or Derek, but I feel like one of them is going to get challenged. So I'll put that out as a prediction that – um, either they end up in an elimination themselves by you know losing or something, or whoever does lose goes ahead and with all the guys left being pretty legit uh, physical threats, calls out one of the big names, the big alliance, um, and tries to take one of them out. Overall grade for the episode, we're gonna give it a B plus. First time go dropping below the A. A minus A plus ranking on the season, but B plus still very good. Uh, it should be known while it doesn't seem like it thus far in the season. I am a tough grader normally. So a B plus is still a very good grade in my book. Still a very good episode. I loved it. Enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun. Those are your awards, your rankings, your quotes, your grades, everything for that. We will move to our final section of the podcast and get out those history books and go to class for a little history lesson on challenge quitters. Time for a history lesson. Now, before we dive into today's history lesson, which is about challenge quitters, I do have to give one disclaimer. Uh, I mention stats relatively frequently on this show, as I do across all the content on the Challenge Historian Instagram, YouTube channel, everything. Mention the stats a lot. Uh, they matter to me in a big way. That's part of you know documenting the history of this. I like looking at this in the view of both a television show and as a sport. And in sports, they got the stats. I like to keep all the stats on everyone. I did for this, though, the disclaimer is this, that my stats don't necessarily match up with the challenge, uh, you know, official stats coming from the challenge. The reason I know that is because so far, a couple times they have flashed a stat or two. The one on this episode that caught my eye being Beth with 21 daily challenge wins, and I have her marked down at 17, so big discrepancy there. Um, that I'm going to look into and figure, try to see if I, you know, made a mistake or um, 
what might be the reason that, but I know there's definitely some discrepancies between maybe what the show would say and what I would say. That is because of a few reasons. The show doesn't put these stats out for the general consumption. That is why one of the main reasons I'm even here um, and always wanted to do this show is because I thought that was one little thing missing from the show is that, you know, when people were in an elimination, we weren't getting a little cue card at the bottom that said, so-and-so's eighth ever elimination, they're five and three, most notable win this, biggest upset loss this, whatever. Um, you know, that's something I wanted to be able to bring to the table with this podcast. And so my stats are all because I've compiled them all using Wikipedia, the challenge wiki fan, watching the seasons and documenting and going season by season and using whatever, using whatever info is available online, as well as rewatching a majority of the seasons over the pandemic quarantine period here of the last year and a half or so. Um, and literally putting together the stats episode by episode on um, who's appearing on episodes, when daily challenges are happening, who's winning them, if tribunals are a part of it, if they're in the tribunals, elimination wins and losses, finals, championships, money won, disqualifications due to injury, fights, quitting, um, and anything else I could think of or kind of scrape together. I'm trying to put it together. That's where all these stats during the history lessons come from. So I'm giving you what I think is the accurate. It is both up to up for debate based on, you know, all the info out there might not be the exact info that the challenge uh, producers and challenge team would go with on their own official challenge information, uh, you know, accounts, whether it be their Instagram, Twitter, on the show itself, whatever. And also there is a bit of a subjectiveness to it on things like, you know, how to count s certain disqualifications of people leaving the game, if it's quitting, if it's injury, how to count something like, for instance, uh, I mentioned last week during the history lesson for the eliminations, I don't don't count in mine if you are a mercenary and get an elimination win or loss. But if you go against a mercenary, I'm counting that towards your record because you're on the full season. So someone like CT, for instance, would have two more uh, elimination wins than what I would credit him with because he has been the mercenary twice and won both times. In fact, he might have three more if you count that he went against both uh, Johnny Bananas and Tyler Duckworth in Cutthroat and beat both of them technically. Um, so he might be, have three more wins, but um, something like that is more subjective that maybe someone else telling these stats would count that I wouldn't. Um, so there are some ways where these are subjective. So that's a big, big, big disclaimer. Um, I will chime in with that from time to time so that that's always known. But now on to the actual history lesson, which is all about challenge quitters. We end this episode with uh, Arissa quitting in just flamethrower fashion and as we said before no matter how epic your speech is quitting is quitting and tj don't like it as we found out here again and got to see classic tj quitter uh rant now in the history of the challenge we have had 23 people quit during a challenge season just quit quit i break out all disqualifications from the show into injuries, fights, and quitting. So as far as just straight up choosing to leave the show for no other reason than wanting to leave, there's been 23 people who have ever done it, and there's been 24 times it has been done because one person has done it twice, and that person is Arissa's opponent or would-be opponent tonight if she wouldn't have quit. That is Beth, the quitting queen, who has quit twice on back-to-back -back seasons, in fact. Inferno 2, Gauntlet 2, she quit back-to-back -back times, and was still invited back for many seasons after that, so shows how much people wanted her on, how good she was for the show, even though she was quitting. She was still being a memorable character throughout those seasons and invited back. So Beth is the only person to have ever quit twice, and that gets and she is one of those 23 people who have at least quit once. Now, Arissa joins that group, moving it to 24 people in 25 times that it has happened. Tangentially to this, the most times ever being disqualified in total. So counting if you're DQ'd because of injury, if you're DQ'd because you got in a fight and are sent home, or if you're DQ'd because you quit. The most ever by anyone getting disqualified is Coral, the legend herself, who would have been someone I would love to see on All Stars. Coral has three disqualifications to her name, twice injured on the gauntlet and fresh meat. One time she quit on the gauntlet three. So she is the only person who has three times been disqualified for one of injury fighting or quitting. 
and worth shouting out while we're here, the person who has been disqualified for fighting the most times, you guessed it, CT with two, both very memorable. And then as far as injury goes, the most injured challenger of all time would be Chet, who has been disqualified twice for injury. Um, so that is the most, uh, Chet, the most injuries, CT, the most fighting and Beth, the most quitting, quitting all three of those with two a piece across those coral with the most disqualifications and challenge history with three times, two injuries, one time quitting. So that is your challenge lesson for the day. And that is it for this episode of the challenge historian. If you are listening on Spotify, please remember to hit that follow button. If you are on Apple podcasts, subscribe, rate, and review those things help in a big, big way, especially for a young podcast like this one. They are very, very much appreciated. So make sure to do that for any daily challenge content you want. Go over to Instagram, follow us at the challenge, excuse me, at challenge historian on Instagram for some daily challenge content and for weekly extra videos posted to YouTube, head over to YouTube, follow us challenge historian on YouTube every Monday, a new video every Thursday, a new podcast on this feed. Next week, we will continue with our recaps of all stars going on to episode five. We're past or we'll halfway through next week's episode. We'll be at the halfway point of the season, four down five to go an amazing season so far, hoping it will continue and hoping you will continue to come back here and recap it all with us at the challenge historian. That's all we've got today. Thank you for your time. I will talk to you next week.